Uh, it's good to see you here today. It's good to be back with you as well after a, uh, a few weeks uh, off and away from me. Uh, my family did a decent amount of traveling, hanging out with family here in Iowa and Indiana. We were in Kansas City, just all over the place. And um, just for some time of refreshment, which I hope that you are getting that time as well. Uh, I also appreciate uh, Kent and Jay and Garrett for speaking. In our Psalm series the past few weeks, I thought they just did a great job. I was able to watch and see each of those and super encouraged uh, by them leading us in this series. You know, what's interesting is that July is almost over. Uh, it's almost done. August is almost here, which kind of sounds like something you say when you begin to get a little bit older, right? Like you start saying things, you're like, yeah, it's almost done. It's almost, summer's almost over. Uh, along with like other phrases like um, money doesn't grow on trees, you know, and when the front door is left open, we're not trying to cool the outside here, kids, and things like the grass looks really dry and all that kind of stuff. Like, so I don't know if, if this was you, but like when you're growing up and your parents would say certain things and you were like, I am never gonna say that. I am never gonna say that. I can't believe that's just super annoying that you say that. And then as you get older, you find yourself saying the very things that you swore you would never say. Like perhaps you've seen these progressive insurance commercials. Have you seen these? These are like some of my favorite commercials of all time. And I've been trying hard over the past few months to figure out how I could weasel one of these into a Sunday morning, part of the Sunday morning message. So I think I finally figured out here how. Okay, so check out. Here's one of them. This is one of my favorites. Do you need a sign to live, laugh, and love? Yes. The answer is no. I can help new homeowners not become their parents. Kiana. Nope. Koe Noah. No. Joaquin. No. It just takes practice. Give it a shot. Do you hear that? Yeah. It's a constant battle. We're going to open a PDF. Who's next? Progressive can't save you from becoming your parents, <laughs> but we can save you money when you bundle home and auto with us. No fussing, no cussing, and no <laughs> All right, there it is. So I love the Keanu. Like, yeah, how do you, Joaquin. Okay, so it's just so good. So maybe this is you, like you've done the same thing. Um, here's the deal. We all are shaped by things. And one of the things that we are shaped by is our parents. It's the people that raise us. And so for better or for worse, as you begin to grow up, the people that are in your lives, and particularly those people that raise you, you will become in some way, for good or for bad, you're gonna become the people that raise you and that influence you. That's one thing that shapes who we are, it's people. But there's also something else that shapes who we are, and, and that is practices. There are certain practices that we give ourselves to that begin to shape and deform what our values are, uh, the way we live, the way we act, the way that we talk. So people shape us, but practices also shape us. So uh, what you eat and uh, uh, how you exercise and whether you bike, you walk, run, or you don't do those things, that shapes you, those practices shape you physically. In fact, we have another uh, dad saying or parent saying that, that goes along with that one, which is if you keep eating fruit snacks, you're gonna turn into one, right? Did you ever hear that one growing up, right? Because those things shape you. Now, you're probably not gonna turn into a fruit snack, but something else might happen if you keep eating fruit snacks because what you eat shapes you physically. Um, what we watch and what we listen to, that shapes us mentally. What we read, what we study, what we research, that shapes us intellectually. And there are practices that form you spiritually in your relationship with God. Um, this, what we're doing right here, this forms you. Do you know that this is an essential practice of what we would call spiritual formation, forming your relationship with God? Is when you gather together with other followers of Jesus, you come together and you sing to him to set your mind on him. We seek to worship him. We give to him. We interact with other followers of Jesus and we open up the Bible and we say, God, what do you have for us? Form us and shape us. Um, your personal spiritual practices, things like reading the Bible on your own, and getting to know what God has to say. I'm learning to pray to God. I'm uh, participating with other followers of Jesus and learning and growing with them. These are all practices that shape and form what you believe about God and what you think about yourself and what you think about the world that we are living in. And all of that, those practices shape your desires and your values. The Psalms are a particular type of practice that is intended to shape us spiritually. The Psalms show us how to talk to God. They show you how to talk to God. And if you're gonna have a relationship with God, you have to learn how to talk to him. I mean, we need to hear from him for sure. That's the word. But we also need to learn how to talk to him. In fact, um, I think you know that you would not expect to have a decent relationship with any other human being without communication being a major part of that relationship, right? You just can't have relationships without communication. And so that's what prayer is. 
And in prayer, we have this book of Psalms that gives us a wide range of prayers that real humans prayed out of real life circumstances and situations that helped to form us and shape us in our communication with God, in our praying towards God. So you might think about maybe how you in your own life, how you learned to cook or how you learned to change the oil on your car or how you learned to mow the grass. And I imagine that for many of us, you learn that from adults in your life, maybe your parents. You, you watch them do these things and maybe they gave you some instruction and some direction about them and then you learned how to do it. Um, one, of, one of my favorite meals to eat, my favorite comfort foods is ham and dumplings. My parents are both from West Virginia and this was a recipe I think my mom got from there and ham and dumplings. And so this is the way it would work. We would have a big ham, bone in. Bone-in, none of those known bone hams, right? So bone-in ham, we'd eat that in one meal, and then for the next meal, my mom would take the leftover bone with a bunch of chunks of meat on there, stick it in a big stock pot, boil it with broth, you throw in carrots and potatoes in there, and then the star of the dish is the dumplings. And if you don't know what dumplings are, they're butter and flour. That's like all they are. It's just butter and flour, right? And so I, I'm surprised probably at the, at the fair this year, they'll probably have dumplings on a stick, you know, just fried butter. You know, they did that before. So no, so that's what you would do. And then you would put the dumplings in that broth. You'd cook it up for like a couple of minutes Then you pour it out and it's piping hot and you burn your mouth the first time you eat the first bite. But it just is so good. It's salty and brothy and just, it's, it's amazing. Now look, my mom learned to do this from her mom, who I think learned from her mom, who learned from her mom, all the way back to the Garden of Eden, I'm pretty sure, when Eve made ham and dumplings there and passed it down through generations. And I learned by watching her be able to do that and helping her press out the dough and cut the little squares and stick them into the stock pot, right? And so it was like this. My mom was like, here, do it like this. Let me show you. And the book of Psalms is the let me show you prayer book. Here it is. This is how you pray. And all of the life circumstances that you face, here are the words to pray to God. Here is what it looks like. You know, we got Missouri is the, uh, Missouri is the show me state. Psalms is the let me show you prayer book of the Bible. And as you read it, you, you learn from it. You pray along with it. You get to know God and you get to know yourself and you get to know how the world works. And you have help for all of the struggles that you face in your real life situations. Um, you, you celebrate life and you know that God is celebrating the joys and the, uh, the victories with you. And you do all of this in concert with the God who created you and loves you and you are shaped spiritually. Um, I, I've told you about this book before called Prayer in the Night. It's by an Anglican priest whose name is Tish Harrison Warren, and it is, it is one of the best books I've read in the last few years. I highly recommend it to all of you. It's called Prayer in the Night. And in that book, Tish Warren says this, we take up prayer not out of triumphant victory or unimpeachable trust. In other words, we're not praying um, out of the sense that we are great victors in everything we're going through in our lives and, and we're, uh, we're taking God and we're moving him to win all of our victories and everything is wonderful and awesome in our lives. And we're not doing it in unimpeachable trust. Like we just know everything that's gonna happen and we're just manipulating or working God on this. We don't always have unimpeachable trust. But we pray because prayer shapes us. It works back on us to change who we are and what we believe. Do you see that? As you pray, as you learn to pray, as you read prayers, as you understand these prayers that are given to us, it forms and it shapes you because prayer, it's an essential practice of the Christian life. And the Psalms are the prayer book of the Bible. It shows you how to do it. And I love this, it gives you words when you don't have them. Because don't you sometimes have circumstances in your life where you're like, I don't know how to pray. I don't know what I'm supposed to say. How do I even do this with God? And maybe you're kind of like, I don't want to pray in groups because I don't really know how to do that and I don't want other people to hear me pray. Well, we've got a prayer book to show us how to do that, how to come before God. But look, here's the struggle that most of us face when it comes to prayer. It's that, um, let's just be honest, we don't think we need it. We, we really don't think that we need to pray. There's not much urgency for many of us or maybe even desire because our lives are decent to good. And some of your lives are great. And at different stages of your life, for us as Western Christians, we tend to range from our lives being pretty decent to being pretty good to being actually really great, right? If we're honest, isn't that what our lives are? And so sure, we have uh, bad days and we have COVID concerns and the Delta variant and inflation concerns, but overall, overall, life is good. And when our life isn't very good, we have Netflix and we have alcohol and we have covered porches to sit on and relax a little bit, right? 
and we can take a vacation and get away for a while. And we can uh, take some Tylenol or Vicodin if it's actually really bad. And that's what we do because mostly our lives are good. Even if they are sometimes mundane and boring, for most of us, the problems that we deal with are, are more like what we call first world problems, right? You know, first world problems. First world problems are the stinking landscaper won't call me back, you know, or my nanny had to cut out early and I got to take care of my kids for an extra couple hours today, right? Or they didn't have my size at Lululemon. I've been there twice now and I can't get, you know, the whatever things that I want from there. You know, look, those aren't insignificant things. Maybe the Lululemon part is a bit insignificant, but they're not exactly horrific either. They're actually pretty relative in comparison to what many people face. And so into this situation that you and I live, prayer can seem unnecessary. It just doesn't really seem like we need it. Something that probably would be good to do, but maybe we'll get to that later. There just isn't an urgency to it until you get a tumor on your liver until your child begins to struggle with something that you don't know how to deal with as a parent, until you lose your spouse, until you get addicted to something that you just can't defeat. And now there's some urgency. Now there's questions and there is heartache and there is struggle. The future looks different for you than it looked a little while before and it's uncertain and it's shaky you realize that everything in your life may change from here on out, it may be very different. And even simple pleasures in those moments like food and a movie, it just doesn't have the appeal that it once did. You've been there before, right? Some of you are in that place right now. And if you aren't, I don't wanna discourage you today, but there's coming a time that you will be in that place. So if that's true, how do you get ready for that? How do you get ready for that? And how do you deal with it if you're in it? Well, remember this, remember that practices form us and the Psalms are a practice to help prepare you in advance for the inevitable difficulties that will come into your life. And not only are they the prayer book, a practice that helps to form you to prepare for those things, they are also a lifeline in the midst of those difficulties that you face. So let's look at one of these Psalms today. It's Psalm 38 to help us be able to prepare for the tragedies. Um, the difficulties, the hard things that you're gonna face in your life. Um, if you've got a Bible or a device, go ahead and turn there to Psalm 38. I'd love you to follow along with me there. But before we look at this Psalm in Psalm 38, I wanna briefly address the why question. The why does God allow pain? Why does God, in general, why does God allow difficulty and hard things into our lives? And I have to say this at the front, um, entire books of hundreds of hundreds of pages have been written on this topic, and I'm gonna address it in two minutes, okay? So this is gonna be brief, and hear me clearly, one small part of the answer. This is just one part of the answer. But one part of the answer is this. Typically, an easy life is a godless life. Typically, an easy life equals a godless, prayerless life. You know, as humans, again, we tend to be content with having a, a decent life, a decent house, and a pretty good career. You throw in a labradoodle and your life is perfect, right? Like, it's amazing. But God knows that everything is not as it seems. And in houses across our suburbs, countless marriages are in trouble. And families are struggling, and people are wondering if there's something more to this life. See, God knows us deep down. He knows us below the surface into the depths of our being and he knows that we often have moments where we say to ourselves, is this all that life is? Is this all that, that, that I'm gonna be in, in this life? Uh, is, this, is this my existence? He knows that we have doubts. He knows that we have fears. He knows that we have questions. He knows that we have struggles and he's jealous for us that we wouldn't stay that way. But if life continues to look good and feel good on the outside, he knows we may never change. And so he allows cancer and he allows an accident and he allows a struggle and he allows a loss to come into our lives to wake us up so that we will look to him and find true satisfaction and real life. That's why I say he's jealous for you because he wants that for you below the surface. Now look, that's not the complete answer for why God allows difficult things into our lives, but it's a big part of the answer. What we know in the midst of anything that we face that is difficult in this life, he is always working for our good. He's always working to draw us to himself and to grow us. And we know that he is with us in all of it. 
You see, I've said this to you so many times before, but we have the only God of any religion in this world that actually came down into our suffering. So our God doesn't stay distant from our suffering and say, I hope you all figure that out down there. It's gonna be really tough. No, he becomes human. Jesus comes into this life, walks on this earth, and he suffers like we suffer. He goes through the struggles that we go through. And even greater than that, he suffers not just with us, he suffers for us in our place, takes up our place on the cross to die for us and resurrects from the grave so that you would know that God is for you in whatever you face. Um, So you would know difficulty and pain is not meaningless, but that he's doing something In the midst of us, the greatest thing that has ever happened in the history of the world came through suffering, God suffering for us. And so we know through whatever we face, he is with us. And one of the ways that he is with us is Psalm 38. In Psalm 38, he gives us words to pray. And he gives us a perspective when difficulty comes into our lives. Now, Psalm 38 is what we might call a repentance psalm. There's a group of psalms that we could put into this category. And they are psalms where the psalmist, the person writing it, comes before God and says, I've screwed up, I've messed up, and there's difficulty and hard things going into my life, and God, I need you to forgive me. Some of the most famous of these psalms are Psalm 32 and Psalm 51. King David wrote those psalms as as well as this psalm in Psalm 38. In Psalm 51, it's David's confession of his sin of adultery with Bathsheba where he, um, he committed adultery with this woman and had her husband killed to try to cover it up. That's a, that's a pretty big time sin, right? And so he comes before God confessing and saying, God, I need you to heal me and help me. And Psalm 38 is like this as well. It's a Psalm of David, the greatest of the Israelite kings. And again, it shows us how do we come to God in the midst of hard things and difficulty? How do we come to God for help and for healing? So let's check this out and get a feel for the Psalm. Psalm 38, I'm gonna read a number of verses uh, starting in verse one. Lord, do not rebuke me in your anger, David says, or discipline me in your wrath. Your arrows have pierced me and your hand has come down on me. Because of your wrath, there is no health in my body. There is no soundness in my bones because of my sin. My guilt has overwhelmed me like a burden too heavy to bear. My wounds fester and are loathsome because of my sinful folly. I am bowed down and brought very low all day long I go about mourning. My back is filled with searing pain. There is no health in my body. I'm feeble and utterly crushed. I groan in anguish of heart. All my longings lie open before you, Lord. My sighing is not hidden from you. My heart pounds, my strength fails me. Even the light has gone from my eyes. My friends and companions avoid me because of my wounds. My neighbors stay far away. Those who wanna kill me set their traps. Those who would harm me talk of my room. All day long they scheme and they lie. So I'm like the deaf who can't hear, like the mute who cannot speak. I have become like one who does not hear, whose mouth can offer no reply. So you get the feel for this prayer, right? Now you might be thinking, okay, Jeremy, I I thought you said we were gonna talk about when difficulty and hard things come into our lives, how do we deal with that? But it seems like in this instance, David is responsible for the difficulty and the hard things that have come into his life. And if you were thinking that way, you would be absolutely correct. That is true, that is exactly what is going on here. The difficulty David faces is a result of his own personal sin. And look, this is one reason that hard things come into our lives. We gotta be honest and just admit it, they come into our lives because we make foolish choices. We sin against God. That means we we say to God, no, I'm gonna do it my way. I wanna live my life like this. We treat people poorly. Uh, We're selfish with our time or our focus. And we've gotta realize that sin has consequences. We can hurt others. We can mess up relationships, we can become addicted. And so that's one reason that difficulties often come into our lives, it is our own choices. But there's also other reasons that difficulties come into our lives. Sometimes you and I face difficulties simply because it's the result of living in a messed up world. The world that we live in, uh, the bodies that we have that, that tend to over time begin to fall apart, right? Like body parts stop working over time. The memory declines. And sometimes accidents just simply happen that are not the result of our personal sin, but things just happen to us. Any of you around in the Grimes, uh, Grimes Johnston area on July 9th of this year? Do you remember what happened on July 9th in a period of about 30 minutes? We had this massive hailstorm. For those of you, did it affect any of your houses? So we live up in Grimes and... Um, 
the clouds are looking very ominous and there was this group of clouds that were going this way and there was another group of clouds that were coming this way. And I was like, wow, that looks like that's about to be a tornado. Who knows what's gonna happen? But it looks like it was gonna pass our house from where we live. My wife very wisely was like, hey, honey, I think I'm gonna put your car in the garage. I'm like, oh, whatever, fine. I think it's gonna pass by us, no problem. So she puts my car in the garage, thank goodness. And then about 20 minutes later, I'm looking out the, one of our front bedroom windows and there is just hail and wind beating on our house. Now I'm videoing what's happening in the front and I see like what I would call maybe dime-sized pieces of hail that are coming down in our front yard. I'm videoing it. So my one daughter, Lexis, comes in. She did the five before early in the service. She says, hey, dad, this hail is crazy. Can I run out and grab some? I'm thinking dime-sized hail. Yeah, it'll toughen you up. That'll strengthen you. Go ahead out and grab some pieces of hail that miss the storm. I'm thinking she's gonna step out onto our back deck and just grab a couple of pieces. Well, when I come into the kitchen area and I look out, she is down in the yard, off the deck, down the stairs, grabbing pieces of hail. And when she comes back, these are the pieces of hail that she came back with. Check these out. That's what she came back with. They're like baseball size. There's a quarter and there's a ruler and you can see how big they are. She should have gone out with a helmet on, I think. One of our neighbors actually did. He put a bike helmet on and he went out in the yard to grab these pieces of hail. Now look, um, just yesterday, I had the insurance adjuster out at our house and there is chalk, like drawings, all over our house to show all of the damage that it did to our house. And it was, it was pretty significant. Now look, I don't think it was my personal sin that caused the hailstorm to happen. If it did, I'm sorry for all of you that also had damage. It's just a result of living in this world where sometimes these sort of natural disasters happen and take place. So look, sometimes uh, the difficulties in our lives are because of our own choices and sin. Sometimes it's just a result of living in this world. And the third reason they happen is sometimes other people cause us pain, right? Sometimes other people try to scam us and hurt us your car warranty is about to expire. Please call this number, right? You get that? Your social security number has been compromised as well, along with the car warranty, and your inbox is full of spam messages, right? Sometimes people, they try to take advantage of us, or they're just plain mean. And sometimes the closest relationships in our lives will cause us pain as well. Here's the amazing thing, though. However the difficulty that you are facing comes into your life, you know that God wants to use it to draw you to himself and to change us. Whatever the reason is, God wants to use it to draw us to himself and to change us. Isn't that incredible? Whether your pain is the result of you living in this world, whether it's uh, the result of someone else hurting you, or whether it's a result of your own stupidity, God looks at you and he says, I can work with that. I can work with that. And I want to work with that. He's always ready to work on you and in you, whatever the cause of your pain. Now, in Psalm 38, the cause of the difficulty is personal sin. And we don't know what the sin is. David actually never tells us what it is. But it's pretty clear that David is admitting that he messed up. And get this, he knows that he messed up because he is sick. Literally, he is physically ill. He talks, did you catch it? He talks about wounds and back pain. Look at verse 7. My back is filled with searing pain. Now, initially on reading this Psalm over the years of times I've seen this, I thought David was being metaphorical here, talking about how he just sort of feels, you know, sin in his body because he's kind of messed up. But I think this is literal. David is literally sick because he talks about wounds and searing back pain. And if you've ever had back pain before, those of you that deal with back pain, you know it's not something that you would wish upon yourself and you often wish that you could get rid of it. I've told you before that for about, I don't know, 20, 25 years, I've had a couple of herniated discs in my, the lowest part of my back. And so most of the time, like I do pretty decent with that. I do exercises, I go to physical therapy, all that kind of stuff. I do it, usually pretty good. But usually about once a year or once every year and a half, the back just says no, right? And it goes out. One time, uh, my wife and I were visiting friends from Indiana and we, we met them halfway in the Quad Cities and spent the weekend with them. We were there on a Sunday and I didn't sleep very well in the bed, and then it was Sunday morning, so we decided to attend a church together out there. So we went to that church, sitting in the chairs in the service. I'm like, oh, this is not good. I go to get up, not feeling good. And then we do what you begin to do as you get older. You go to Cracker Barrel after church, and you... <laughs> Never been back since this occasion, but uh, we went to Cracker Barrel and as we're leaving Cracker Barrel, I go to open the door to, to walk out of the Cracker Barrel and my back just locks up and I fall immediately on the ground in the fetal position and I can barely move. So I'm writhing in pain, laying on the ground of Cracker Barrel out on that porch where they've got the wooden rockers 
And I'm laying there and my friend has seen this happen before. And so he's very compassionate. He starts videoing me and he's laughing <laughs> at the situation. Michelle's like, oh no, okay, what are we gonna do? I'm laying on the ground, I can barely think, but I look over and I see a lot of gray hairs rocking on the rockers. And one guy in there has shorts on and he's got like a wound that is bandaged on his leg and he's like bleeding, like out of the wound. And I'm just looking over there and I'm thinking in my mind, these guys gotta be like, you young buck, you don't know what pain is, you know, get up off the ground. What do you? So that's what's going on in my mind, all right? And so somehow I was able to like get up, get in the vehicle, we drove back home. I, I don't even remember the whole experience what happened because I was in so much pain. And here's the thing, if you've had that kind of pain and some of you have chronic issues like that that you deal with, you know that is the real deal. It's a big deal. The psalmist here is facing something like that. But in his instance, his sin has caused the physical pain that he is facing. So think about this, this is interesting. He acknowledges his personal sin caused sickness. We almost never think like this today, do we? We don't think that way. I mean, uh, we probably realize that our personal decisions sometimes have consequences. Like if you are a diabetic and you choose to eat a gallon of ice cream, you're gonna have a problem, right? And that problem is your fault. You made a bad decision there to do that. We know there's a direct link. But normally we don't think that when we are sick, God's disciplining us for personal sin. Apparently though, sometimes he does according to Psalm 38. Now we have to be really careful here. And some of you are already thinking in your mind, uh-oh, uh-oh, what's he saying? The Bible is clear to us that not all sickness is a result of sin. So whenever you get a cold or your allergies start acting up, it doesn't necessarily mean that you've been watching too much television or lying to your parents, okay? However, I, I do think probably if you listen to too much country music, you will go deaf eventually. Direct coral, no, kidding, kidding, okay. So look, the Bible is clear, not all sickness comes from sin. Hear me clearly, not all sickness comes from sin, but sometimes it does, sometimes it does. And perhaps we should consider that a little bit more. I mean, God made all of us. When he made you, God didn't just make you to be a spiritual being, he did make you to be that, but he also made your physical body and he made your emotions and he made your psychology and he made the social side of you as well. All of those things are together. We are holistic beings and things are way more connected than we often think. But here's what we can know for sure. Whatever the result of your sickness or why your sickness came, God wants to use that sickness to draw you to himself. God always wants to use sickness in our lives to reveal any pride that we have, to reveal any dependence upon ourselves, to help us see if we are walking with him, to say, God, is there any hurtful way that is in me and help me and heal me? Now, I don't think we need to drive ourselves crazy every time you sneeze to figure out if that sickness is attached to sin in our lives. I'm not saying that. But what we should do is to always see sickness as an opportunity to repent of any sin in our lives. We should use it as an opportunity to reflect, to step back and say, God, is there some? thing in me that's not quite right, and then look to him for his help and for his healing. You know what sickness does? Sickness reminds us that we're not in control. If you ever think you're in control, just wait for the flu to come. Just wait till you get COVID. Just wait till you get a really bad cold. Just wait till your allergies start acting up. It is a reminder to you that you are in control of so little in your life, but there is one who is in control. And so wherever sickness comes, it is pain that's intended to push us to Jesus. Sickness is pain to push you to Jesus. It's headaches and stomach problems and allergies that help you realize that you are not all that and that you need a savior. It reminds us that we have weaknesses and that we need someone stronger to help us. Whether it's the flu or fibromyalgia, it pushes you to Jesus. David is seeing all of this in our psalm. Check it out again in verse one, he pleads to God for mercy in the midst of his pain. Lord, don't rebuke me in your anger or discipline me in your wrath. Please don't do that, God. And then he goes on to take responsibility for it. Verse three, because of your wrath, uh, there is no health in my body. God, you've allowed this to happen. There's no soundness in my bones because of my sin. My guilt has overwhelmed me. It's like a burden that's too heavy to bear. God, this is my fault. I take responsibility for it. And then he shows us that this Sin, it's caused him physical pain, right? Again, verse five, my wounds fester and are loathsome because of my sinful folly. And verse seven, my back is filled with searing pain. But it's not just physical pain that David endures. Did you notice the emotional, the psychological pain that he's feeling in verse six? I'm bowed down and brought very low. All day long, I go about mourning. Verse eight, I'm feeble and I'm utterly crushed. I groan in anguish in my heart. 
Verse 10, my heart pounds, my strength fails me, even the light has gone from my eyes. I don't even wanna be awake. I don't even wanna face reality. I'm in so much pain and difficulty. Verse 13, I'm like the deaf who can't hear, like the mute who cannot speak. You ever been so sick before that you're like, I just wanna sleep? Everybody get away from me. I don't want anybody to see me. I'm gross and disgusting right now. I feel horrible. I can't even think straight. Just leave me alone. That's where David finds himself here. But it's not just that. So it's not just physical pain and it's not just emotional pain that he's feeling. But you also notice this in verse 11. My friends and companions avoid me because of my wounds and my neighbors stay far away. And then he goes on to say, my enemies are after me. They're trying to pounce on me as well. So here's David with physical, emotional, and social Agony, all coming together as a result of his sin. I, I think about COVID for those of you that, that had to experience COVID and you got some of the bad symptoms of it, right? COVID was like physical pain, mental, emotional pain, and you're isolated. You have to stay away from other people. It sort of brought all of these things together. I remember when I had it, when I had COVID, I had what I would call you for people talking about the brain fog. I remember at one point sitting down in the midst of this and I'm trying to write some things down, right? And I'm just, my pen is in my hand and I'm like, what is the, ah! I just, I couldn't, I just couldn't even think. And it was all of these things, the physical, the, the social isolation for people all coming together. So here's the deal. When difficulty comes into your life, when you are sick in your life, regardless of why this comes, what do you do when this happens? Whether your sin causes the difficulty you're facing or it's just the result of living in this world, how do you handle it? Look at what David does in verse 15. Lord, I wait for you. You will answer me, Lord my God. Lord, I wait for you. We're not very good at that, are we? I mean, in our culture that we're in, like we are not waiters. We don't, we don't wait on things at all. We are not good at waiting. Microwave popcorn has ruined me for this, all right? A minute and 45 seconds, I got a movie theater butter goodness sitting on my lap watching a movie. Less than two minutes. It's amazing. El Mariachi's ruined me for this as well. Or any Mexican restaurant. You go to the Mexican restaurants. You know how that works. You go down, you sit down at the Mexican restaurant, the waiter comes to take your order. You're like, I think I'm going to take a speedy guns. Oh, thank you. It is here. How did you do that so quickly? If you're ever there and it takes them five minutes to get your feet, you're like, wow, they're really slow today, aren't they? They're just, not, they're just behind here. We're, we're used to drive throughs fast food, expediency, buy it now, get it now, delivered right now, right? And so like, we're not real good at waiting. But get this, David's life was off. He had sinned, he was not following God. In some way, he was going the opposite direction of God. And so God allowed a sickness to come into his life to jolt him awake to just shake him a little bit and wake him up and say to him, David, you're not going the right way. Something is messed up in your life and I need to get your attention because you don't wanna go that way. And you notice his response is the right response. He says, all right, God, I'm bringing it to you and I'm gonna wait for you. I'm gonna trust you to work. I'm gonna let you tell me what is up. So please search my heart right now and show me where I'm off. And by the way, also please heal me because this really, really stinks and I feel terrible. That's what he does before God. Lord, I wait for you. You will answer me, Lord my God. And then he goes on to say this. I said, do not let my enemies gloat or exalt themselves over me when my feet slip. I'm about to fall and my pain is ever with me. Any of you have chronic pain that there really is no long-term solution to except for um, you have to go to pain management? That stinks. David is feeling something like that here. He says in verse 18 then, so I confess my iniquity. Wherever I'm responsible, I'm troubled by my sin. Many have become my enemies without cause. Those who hate me without reason are numerous. Those who repay my good with evil, they lodge accusations against me, though I seek only to do what is good. Now, God, I'm following you. I wanna do what's right. So Lord, do not forsake me. Do not be far from me, my God. Come quickly to help me, my Lord and my Savior. How do we handle difficulty? What are we supposed to do when that comes into our lives? We, David says here, we wait on God. We wait on God. Whether it's because of your personal sin or the attacks of others or just living in this world, the answer is always the same. It is we wait on God. We look to him. But we can get a little bit more specific on this. And I think that there are two ways in this Psalm that David gives us to do this waiting on the Lord. How do we wait on the Lord? What does that actually mean? 
We wait on the Lord, first of all, in this way, we are open with him. You wait on the Lord by being open with him. Bring your emotions, your questions, and your frustrations before God. Did you notice in this prayer, it's all there? All of that is there with David. He's just letting all of that come out. And if you read this carefully, you go back and you read it again, you'll notice that there is some complexity to what's going on here. As in, there are some things that aren't exactly clear, but there's lots of different pieces that are all coming together. And at least for me, it causes some questions in my mind. So here's the kinds of questions that I ask. Um, is this my fault or is it others' fault? Is it my sin or is it, other, is it enemies and neighbors that are abandoning me and other people that are coming after me? What has caused the difficulty? And David's like, God, I think that you will help me. I'm asking you to help me, but I'm also a little bit uncertain, so I'm pleading with you. And God, you're really letting me be torn up. This is really hard and this really stinks. And I know it's my fault in one sense, but I'm also pleading for mercy because it's too much for me to handle. And look at verse nine. All my longings lie open before you. My sighing is not hidden from you. The light's about to go out from my eyes. I don't know if I can handle it anymore, but I think it's my fault and I'm gonna confess whatever's wrong with me. But also people are mean and I don't like it. And it's too hard for me to handle. And all of that comes out from David. Look, Here's what I would tell you. God knows everything you are thinking and feeling, so you might as well come out with it. There's no reason for you to hide it. Take it to him. Vocalize it before him. Say it to him. Don't be like the little kid who's playing hide and go seek and the little three-year-old who's like, I'm gonna hide from you, right? And they do this. They're like, you, I'm like, buddy, like, I can see you. My eyes aren't closed. Just because your eyes are closed doesn't mean that I don't know what the reality is right here, that you're sitting right there, right? Don't be like that with God. Uh, if I just don't say it. No, just go ahead and say it. Just say it, just bring it out. Just let God have it. Be open with him. For David, even though this situation is his fault, he's still open about how hard it is and how he's at his end. And you know what? God hears him. God wants David to do this. He put it in the Bible so that you could see this prayer, so you could recognize this is acceptable and this is what God wants you to do. Look, there are a lot of religions that don't allow for this. We should step back and be amazed that God allows this to happen. There's a lot of religions where you can't have any doubts, you can't have any questions, just follow the stinking rules, right? It's kind of the idea that you get, just do the rules, do the duties, do the practices, and hopefully if you do enough of those things, God will give you a decent life and not let anything terrible come into your life. But if that was the true God, we wouldn't have the Psalms. The Psalms push hard against a no doubting, everything is perfect, it's just about obeying the rules kind of a faith. Even when the doubts, the questions, and the struggle is your own fault, do you see how amazing this is? This is David's fault for what has happened. And still he can come before God and says, but I think it's too much. The consequences of what happened, I can't bear anymore. God, I wanna do what you want me to do, but I need your mercy to heal me and see me. But God is that big. He's that kind. He is that good to us. So be honest with him. And then be honest about yourself. Be honest with God and to be honest about yourself. Um, David waits on God and he looks to God by being open with God about his pain and by admitting that he screwed up. This is verse three again, right? There is no soundness in my bones because of my sin and my guilt has overwhelmed me. And then the key in verse 18, I confess my iniquity and I'm troubled by it. I'm deeply troubled by my sin. There's no excuses here. There's no blaming others. David just owns it. He says, this is my fault. And God, yes, I'm struggling because um, others have abandoned me and people are mean to me and my back hurts <laughs> really bad, God. But I know this is my sin. I caused it and I need you to forgive me. Look, there is a really hard to explain intersection here between God caring about the peripheral things going on, like other people's part in this and the physical side of it and our own responsibility for creating our problems. But here's what I do know, God cares about all of it. And he wants to hear us and he wants to help us in it. And the way for you to receive that help from God is just simply to own up to your sins. Um, to not shift the blame on others, to not pout about it or make excuses, to just plain own it before God. Search me, O oh God, and know my heart. The word uh, confess there in verse 18, it means to say the same thing to say the same thing that God says about your sin. 
And so what we're doing when we confess is we're saying, God, I was going the wrong way, but I wanna line up with you, so show me what the right way is. Forgive me for where I have been off track, where I'm missing the mark, and help me to just be committed to following your way. And so waiting on God is our act of embracing what God says and what he wants. It's you and I seeking to line up with him and then letting him sort out the people and the sickness part, right? We confess our failure, we wait on the Lord, and then we anticipate his saving grace. That's how David ends. My Lord and my Savior, I'm trusting that you will save me. Now, God's saving you in this instance. It doesn't always mean that he's gonna heal your sickness. It doesn't always mean that he's gonna take all of that physical pain away, but it does mean that he will give you his peace and he will give you strength in your difficulty as you look to him. So look, hear me carefully, church. I don't know what is coming into your life this week. I don't know what's gonna happen this next month, but pain will inevitably find you. I know this, if you're a human being, pain is going to find you. I do know that some of you are in it right now. In fact, there are so many Sundays when, um, I don't know if any, any of the rest of you do this, but when I'm singing the songs that we're singing here, I'm singing them as prayers for so many of you, for my own life and my family and for you, that the battle belongs to him. I'm thinking about you and I'm praying for you because I know that you are going through it. A number of you are going through it even right now. And I know that for many of you, um, what you're going through, it's not your fault. It's not your sin that has caused that. But I know that even in the midst of that, God wants to use it to draw you to himself and to be there for you. There's others of you that I know that your sin is causing it. And if that's you, hear me clearly. You need to confess the difficulty that you're facing in your life is because you have run from God or you've decided to do life your own way and you need to turn back to him like David does here and yield to him. And for some of you, you know what else? Let's make it more complicated. It's a mix of all those things. You have some fault in it. Others have some fault in it. Life circumstances have, have contributed to the difficulty. It's kind of a jumbled mess of things. But regardless of the situation each of us is dealing with, the path is the same path. Psalm 38 lays it out for us. Psalm 38 gives you words in your pain. It provides a practice of prayer to lead you to God and to wake you to his saving grace. But don't wait for the pain to come before you look to the Lord. Learn to confess before him now. Ask for his mercy now. And if you are in it, take up Psalm 38 and pray with an openness before God and an honesty about yourself, and he will answer, and he will save you. 